the Autism Research Institute relies on the generosity of donors like you to make this webcast possible. If you enjoy this presentation, please consider making a donation. Thank you. Before we get started, I'd like to introduce our speaker. Kimberly Taylor has served as a vice president of the North Carolina Bar Association, as chair of the Education Committee of the North Carolina Association of District Court Judges, and as chair of the Rural Courts Commission. She also served on the board of the Association of Women Attorneys and was elected Judge of the Year in 2008. Ms. Taylor and her husband, Timothy Bird, have five children, and their middle son, Jarrett, was diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder at age three. She currently serves on the board of this organization, the Autism Research Institute. Ms. Taylor served as chair of the Safe and Sound Task Force for the Autism Society of America and received the President's Award from the Autism Society of North Carolina. She also helped to develop training criteria and legislation to mandate training for law enforcement and first responders in North Carolina on issues of recognition and response to individuals on the autism spectrum. She served on the Board of Disability Rights of North Carolina for six years. In 2006, she was appointed to the North Carolina Joint Study Committee on Autism, which recommended modifications to training for law enforcement, first responders, judges, lawyers, and others serving the court system, which resulted in modifications to the North Carolina Rules of Evidence and the definition of disability in the North Carolina General Statutes. Her work continues through efforts like this to encourage training of all groups having contact with autism spectrum individuals. These webinars are made possible through generous donor support. If you'd like to contribute, please visit our website at autism.com. Hey Denise and hey everyone, um, this is Kim Taylor and let me just first apologize because I do have a North Carolina accent. Um, you are in the southeast at least here and it is about uh, 108 in the afternoon in North Carolina. Um, let me just start by saying that uh, Denise has gotten a lot of the materials I'll be talking about today and if you have uh, not received those you can get those from Denise at autism.com. Uh, she is welcome to share those with anyone who wants to see the materials and the reason I sent them to uh, Denise is so that she can share them with all of you. Uh, I'll start by saying that as Denise said I am uh, retired as a district and superior court judge in North Carolina. Uh, I do have a son um, who is 29 now, and he is on the autism spectrum disorder. Uh, he was diagnosed with autism at age three. I have a, um, a husband who is uh, retired from law enforcement. He was a deputy sheriff uh, for almost 20 years and retired because of uh, an accident that he had. So he is now uh, helping me uh, do this work, uh, spreading awareness about autism spectrum disorder to uh, people in the court system, including uh, law enforcement and first responders. I'm going to be happy to listen to your questions, and I don't know uh, if I'm talking to parents or to people uh, in law enforcement or both. Uh, so I do have many roles that I play, and I still uh, am an attorney. I practice law in um, North Carolina, western part of North Carolina, and I do represent um, people in criminal court and in family court and re also represent people in personal injury cases. So I do still uh, go to court a lot. I have some trials this afternoon, so we'll uh, be getting ready for those while I'm talking to you. Um, I'd like to hear questions, and first let me just say, uh, I assume that most of you, and I'm going to assume that from the start, are familiar with autism and the unique uh, characteristics of people um, on the autism spectrum so that many people uh, that are on the spectrum have uh, or may have run-ins with the criminal justice system primarily because of the disability and because of autism that other people may not have. And that's why we think that this is a very important issue. It's come to be a very important issue to parents, caregivers, and people on the spectrum because uh, many, many people in law enforcement, first responders, and others that may come upon a scene uh, involving somebody on the spectrum may not have learned or be made aware of the characteristics of someone on the spectrum. Uh, and let me say also that my son uh, is not high functioning. He is, um, I don't know what the appropriate word for him is. I think he's really sweet, cute, and he's the light of my life, uh, but he is not a high functioning person. 
and you would probably be able to tell if you saw him for a few minutes that he's uh, there's something different about him. But I know many people uh, that are watching and listening uh, are either uh, high functioning or have someone that they care for who is high functioning and who would not be easily identified if they were out in public. So this uh, creates some unique situations. Uh, let me just start out, and it's easier for me to answer questions that you uh, feel you have and realize that I'm licensed to practice law in North Carolina, but not in any other state, so I can't give legal advice to people in other states. Um, could get in trouble with my state bar for doing that. So let me just start out by seeing what kind of questions people have. Okay, great. I will uh, read you some questions. And then we'll go from there. People are typing in questions right now. And then we've also got some questions people sent ahead of time. And one of the first questions I wanted to ask actually relates to what you were just saying about recognition. Um, there's a parent who wrote us who said that she's actually trying to get an autism recognition event planned in her community to educate first responders and, uh, and also teachers. She's talking about teachers here. So she wondered about resources for that and what steps people take to do that. Have you seen those kinds of events performed? I have, um, and actually I've been to, to many of them uh, in, in Florida, North Carolina, Minnesota, uh, Wisconsin. Uh, my friend uh, Dennis DeBaugh uh, has helped with many of those events, and uh, Jimmy Donahoe, Bill Canada up in, uh, in Boston and in Florida uh, have helped, and usually uh, we go through the local autism society. Uh, whatever parent group there may be available, uh, whatever ad ad advocacy group may be available in the area uh, to, to help us raise money for those events and to get speakers uh, for the event. So I don't know where uh, the person asking the question is from, but uh, that's the first step that I would take is to, to gather people with the same interests and, and try to get um, those folks um, to help with raising funds, raising awareness about the event and uh, getting your speakers in place. Great. Now, do they, yeah, so, do so could they contact someone like Dennis DeBoat, or is there another resource like that that you'd highly recommend? Well, I, I would contact, and, and, and again, it depends on where she is. Um, we do have a lot of resources available, and she can contact me. She can contact Dennis. Um, I have uh, contact information for Dennis, for Jimmy, and for uh, Bill Canada, uh, we uh, would be happy to share what we know about people who might be available to help, uh, you know, organize an event in whatever area it is in the uh, U.S. Uh, Genevieve Athens also, who works with us on the ARI board, to help uh, with uh, getting uh, resources together. Okay, great. Um, so the next question, so this is a person who probably hasn't had this opportunity in their community yet. They're asking about what's the first thing I should say to a police officer, security guard, etc., to diffuse the situation. So they're looking for some general language. They're saying, my son sometimes hits people unexpectedly. We've been in some difficult situations several times. When I say that he has autism, that doesn't always help. Well, you know that uh, when our uh, children are young, um, people are much more sympathetic and they understand when you have a three or four year old out in public um, and they hit someone that um, all this happens and they'll be much more able to understand and, and be sympathetic. And, and my son is 29 and Denise, I think you, you've got some pictures of him, but he, he's a big kid. He's um, weighs a whole lot more than I do and, and then his care, caregivers do and if he gets upset in public, you know, he could easily have what we call meltdown and, and hit somebody. And uh, we've had a situation, grocery store, uh, parking lots and things of that nature where he might get overwhelmed by the noises and the sounds and, you know, when people come up to him and, and try to speak to him and he'll get out at somebody. And we just have to say uh, he's, um, he's Autistic, but, you know, if you say autistic and they've never heard that word before, it doesn't help. So you have to say that he cannot control this behavior. We've got it under control. And please just step away uh, and let him calm down. Because obviously, at least with my son, you have to, to give him some space. You cannot get up in his face. You can't get close to him when he's in that mood. Uh, if you are, uh, and this happens to us, probably the 
one of the scariest things is, he, is if he's in an enclosed area like a car and he gets upset. And uh, you've got to you've got to deal with it, that situation and try to deal with it in advance. Uh, so we go when we go out to eat and take him to eat, and we've had a great experience. I just have to say with Olive Garden. Because we'll call ahead and say, we're bringing him to, to dinner. They'll make a uh, place for him to eat in a quiet corner uh, and even let us uh, order the food in advance and have it there at the table so he doesn't have to wait and stand around with the crowd. And that helps quite a bit because they are very, very nice about understanding and getting prepared for him to come in. But that's the first thing. It's just if people don't know what the word autism means, it doesn't help you to say it. So you have to quickly give a little bit better explanation. Okay, a question we have here is related to the form that we sent out. They're asking about, there was a form that you sent that said, I believe it was for so people could send it ahead to public agencies and to law enforcement. So would that be something somebody could use to help educate about an adult family member with autism so that agencies are sort of pre-informed? Um, I guess you're, you're probably talking about a special needs form, yes. and that was just a sample of the form that uh, we developed. That and that's for the Iredell County Sheriff's Office, uh, which is the agency that my husband worked with. But we've also done that form for other agencies here in North Carolina and also um, in Florida. And yes, it's what we what we would use that for would be to take it to the whatever you call your ecom or emergency communications agency, 911 agency and to your local uh, police department or sheriff's department, whatever agency would receive a call if you got an emergency call from your home uh, so that they would say or would be able to flag your residence and say this call has come from a residence uh, with a person that has the following special needs. Uh, and it doesn't have to be a child, of course. It could be an adult. It could be any um, person in that residence. And if, for example, we, it doesn't have to be some sort of criminal behavior. It could be a fire or any sort of emergency so that when the people, the first responders or law enforcement comes there, they're aware of potential issues and uh, can take uh, methods or preventive methods to prevent some sort of bad things happening there in the residence. Um, for example, uh, Bill Canada, uh, who's a fire uh, uh, fireman, retired now, but a retired per, uh, fireman from Massachusetts, had a situation when they went to a fire. There was a person there at the fire uh, scene inside the house who had who was on the spectrum, autism spectrum, and wouldn't leave the house because she was so upset uh, about the smoke, the fire, the fireman's uniform, uh, their helmets and such, that she wouldn't go out. And it turned out really badly uh, that they could not get her out of the house. So if they had known in advance that someone like that was in the house, or if the uh, girl had been trained and seen firemen's uniforms in the past would have helped a lot. Okay, and relating to that, we got some questions from parents asking, do you recommend actually meeting with your county or city law enforcement just to talk to them directly about your child with autism? And if they wanted to do that, who would be the right person to interface with? Uh, we absolutely do recommend doing that, and uh, we've had a lot of success with that because in many areas, these folks, they're public servants. Uh, they work for you. Um, either they're elected by you or they are appointed by someone who's elected. Uh, they, they don't want to injure anybody. Uh, they don't want someone to get hurt. They don't want to be hurt. So there, it's very much in, in their interest uh, to, to help you and to meet you ahead of time so that they can, you can explain to them about whatever special needs someone may have. So uh, the person that you're caring about or yourself can get familiar with what sort of tools, um, equipment, uh, uniforms that they may wear when they come to your house or come on the scene uh, so that there, there's a familiarity and a communication there between yourself and that agency. As far as the person to contact, it would depend on where you are. Uh, if you're, for example, in North Carolina, you would contact your elected sheriff if you were in the county. Uh, if you were in the city limits, you would contact uh, the police chief or whoever their liaison is for the general public. So in large cities, for example, in Charlotte, North Carolina, we contact 
the public liaison and you could easily call or Google that agency and find out the correct person to contact. The other good thing about that is if you do that in writing by email or somehow or another by letter, you've got a record that you've made an effort to contact that agency and that you have, uh, you have tried hard to uh, make sure that whoever it is that you're concerned about uh, has had a, a chance to meet with that local agency. So if something does happen in the future, uh, you know that you have done what you could to, to make arrangements and, and meet those people in advance. Okay, great. Um, we've got a couple questions from people who are on the spectrum. They are asking, do you recommend that we car I carry a card that identifies my diagnosis that I can share, or is it risky to reach in your pocket if you're talking to a law enforcement official? It's a, a good question. That's a really good question, and I mean, we have actually had incidents, as some of you may know, where someone has reached in the pocket and Law enforcement, uh, understandably, doesn't know what you're reaching for. Um, yes, I would recommend a card. If, if someone is, is I mean, if, if I am stopped by law enforcement, it makes me nervous and stressed. Um, if you are uh, on the spectrum and you're going to be nervous and stressed by those blue lights and the sirens and maybe a crowd of people gathering, I mean, how much more uh, are you going to be unable maybe to communicate what you need to communicate so yes, I'd have some sort of card or uh, something, but I would not have it in my pocket. If you're driving your car, I would have it somewhere, uh, maybe on the dash, somewhere in the open, so that when you reach for it, you don't have to go in your pocket. You don't want to have to go in your glove compartment, because that's similar to going in your pocket if you're in the car. Uh, officers are not going to feel comfortable with you going into some interior uh, compartment in your car when they're standing there at your car window. So you want to go, you want to have that item available out in the open, maybe laying out on your dash or somewhere where they can see it uh, when you reach for it or you can just point to it uh, would be my recommendation. And I mean, similar to wearing your medical or bracelet. You don't have to go in your pocket for that. So I would wear it somewhere like that. Do you know, is there a medical alert type bracelet for autism? We have uh, actually gotten one for our son. We had to, what we had to do was go in and out. This was so, quite a few years ago, so I need to check that. But I believe you can order something special for your uh, for yourself or your uh, for your care, whoever it is that you're needing to get the uh, bracelet for. Okay, great. Okay, uh, this next person is asking. This is I, I don't know if you can answer this directly, but it's an interesting question. They're talking about. Um, they have a high-functioning son who is experiencing bullying at school, and he gets in trouble. There's covert bullying happening and get in trouble for aggression toward peers. They're not asking for advice about how to diffuse that. They're more just asking, if police were called to the school, what kind of steps are parents generally advised to take to communicate effectively? Do you just call a lawyer? What's the best thing to do without sounding defensive? Well, unfortunately, that's happening a lot, too. Uh, we, we've had uh, you know, kids at school, young kids, um, young as uh, 9 and 10, uh, who uh, were actually placed in custody and placed in handcuffs um, because law enforcement has certain training uh, for their own protection, protection of others to actually restrain people. Um, when they go to scene and someone's out of control and injuring someone or property, uh, so what, again, what I would suggest is uh, in, in a lot of schools, at least in this state, there are school resource officers that work in the school uh, who are there to work at that school and make sure that uh, things are safe and secure. That, that's the person you should contact in advance about your, your child. Uh, if there is no school resource officer in, in your school, then you need to contact your local agency once again in advance of any problems, say, look, we've got uh, a child at, at this school who does behave in this manner, and I would even share maybe some of the information so you can verify it's, uh, it's true, and that uh, if this behavior occurs, this is what needs to happen, so that hopefully uh, they will not come into the school and see your child uh, acting out and assume that they're just being mean or, or, 
uh, not con complying with directions, they just can't control the behavior. Uh, and of course, we have recommendations about ways to calm down people. And the, we, we're actually trying to develop, and we have developed some guidelines for school resource officers and for uh, officers coming into a school that we'd be happy to share. Okay, great. Um, another question, people are asking about airport security. So what are the rules there? What's different or the same from there? Well, it, it's an, an ADA issue uh, because people on the autism spectrum, uh, obviously, they, they don't have a, sometimes an outward disability, but they do have a diagnosable disability and they uh, should be treated as such. So if we are not, of course, willing to disclose it, then we can't take advantage of the um, what's available to us as aids to someone with disabilities. But uh, just as someone in a wheelchair gets assistance or someone who has vision or hearing problems gets assistance, I think we should uh, enforce um, assistance that could be available for someone on the spectrum. Um, I've been through airport security, of course, and it's difficult you know, so for someone who uh, doesn't have uh, autism. So I, I understand why it would be a real problem for someone on the spectrum uh, who's asked to take off their shoes, their jacket, their belt, uh, and then goes through and then gets searched. And it's a real problem. Uh, I think clearly that, that you should, um, when you buy your airline ticket, put in that there are special needs. Let the airline know that there, there could be an issue and when you, um, when you go through security, there should be someone there to assist. I think that you're entitled to that to that uh, treatment, and we haven't really done enough to uh, educate people in the airline airports, and we probably should do more more of that. I know that some airports do have the opportunity if you if you can make time for it to go ahead and practice. And I know we have that here. I'm in the Seattle area and we have that. And I know a number of airports have put those those programs in place. So I know that's something that parents can take advantage of for people of any age who, who are on the spectrum. So there is that that as well. Um, the next question is <laughs> This is an interesting question. What qualifies as, quote, illegal behavior? My daughter stims a lot and does make a lot of noises that can be disruptive, but is this illegal? We're tending to stay home more and more because I'm just not sure if what she is doing violates other people's rights or not. I don't, under, I don't really understand why stimming would violate someone's rights or being loud or making noises. Uh, we've had issues, of course, with my son uh, when he was young or even now when we go into restaurants, he, he makes unusual sounds and you still have people who are uh, just don't understand or don't want to understand um, about people, other people's uh, inability to control those sounds and we plainly just don't go to eat in some of those places because people are rude about it. Uh, but I don't know any, of anything that's illegal about making noises. And when you're talking about stemming, I'm not sure I know what kind of stemming because some people stem uh, by hitting themselves or hitting uh, objects or things that might be considered, um, uh, maybe by a stretch of imagination, be considered some sort of illegal behavior. But of course, if the stemming is hitting other people, that may be considered an assault. There has to be some element of intent. Uh, a specific intent to assault someone and with someone on the spectrum uh, there's a real issue whether they intended to do that, um, whether they're able to control their behavior. But as with the question not really explaining what the stemming behavior is, I, I don't believe it would be per se illegal. Okay. The next question is what resources do you recommend for adults on the spectrum who have behavioral health or mental health diagnosis. Is there something we can share with the police department or the DA's office? Um, and in conjunction with this, somebody's also asking about just online resources like that, if you know of any. Oh yeah, we there are a lot of them. Uh, I would start out with uh, Autism Risk Management, which is um, Dennis Vault's website. And there are uh, videos there that uh, we developed uh, with Dennis, and uh, we actually did 
uh, resources for autism and the court system uh, are on Dennis's website. We did a video uh, for uh, autism in the criminal justice system uh, back in 2010. Uh, that's still a pretty good video. It has some information on it. Uh, it depends on what state you're in as well, Denise, and you know that um, we, we have sort of a list of attorneys that might do work uh, for people on the spectrum. We don't have uh, a good enough list, I don't think, but we, we got a some, somewhat of a list. Uh, there are more and more people, of course, being diagnosed, and uh, the more people on the spectrum, uh, the more there are that have uh, people in the court system, maybe lawyers, judges, prosecutors, who are going to be familiar with it and um, maybe be willing to assist. But those kinds of resources and what's available to you will depend on what part of the country you're in. But I would certainly um, recommend going to um, Autism Risk Management uh, for uh, resources for uh, to avoid what we call unfortunate situations. Uh, there are also many other uh, folks that provide some resources, so you can Google that uh, site and Google that uh, that issue and whatever particular issue it is. Of course, Autism uh, Speaks has resources available as well. Um, and if you'll send us a question, um, you'll have my contact information and I can try to direct you to. Okay, and so you talked a little bit about the court system, and I know that's an area of expertise for you. So could I've had a few questions from people whose loved ones are either going to be experiencing testimony or they're going to uh, themselves be, be going through a court situation. So could you talk a little bit about that communication that, can, that needs to occur between the professionals involved and also if, if the person on the spectrum needs to testify, what steps you might take? Well, we'll start out with, uh, of course, people on the uh, autism spectrum could be uh, a defendant uh, charged with a criminal offense or some, uh, they're fairly common as uh, right now is adults, adult males mainly, being charged with uh, distribution uh, or possession of uh, child pornography. We have a lot of those cases. and. Uh, they're very serious, uh, extremely serious cases, and I get a lot of emails from parents all over the country about those. Um, we also get, of course, more or less serious uh, cases, but still criminal cases of assault, um, sometimes uh, peeping Tom cases, or cases in which uh, someone on the spectrum may be charged with shoplifting or larceny. Um, because they look suspicious in the store, maybe they pick something up and, and forget that they have it. Um, so we, we, we've got a lot of uh, criminal justice issues. Uh, also, someone on the spectrum could be uh, charged with uh, some sort of civil offense, maybe injuring someone and sued in civil court, uh, in addition to which we have uh, family law issues in which someone on the spectrum may be either a parent or a child who's subject to the custody action, and I do a lot of that kind of work. Uh, in addition to that, we have uh, people on autism, on the autism spectrum who are victims. Uh, sadly enough, uh, children or people on the spectrum who are nonverbal or not able to clearly communicate may be victimized and, and chosen uh, by some sort of offender because they're not able to, to speak up. So what we're doing now is encouraging, uh, in that particular case, prosecutors uh, to, to bring in someone who is a professional or someone who is specialized in uh, autism uh, and so that they can help the prosecutor communicate with that person and to bring in, of course, the caregiver, whoever it is that uh, uh, is able to communicate with the victim and if, if there is a defendant who is, uh, you know, on the spectrum as well, we need to be able to communicate with that person within the court system. Um, I'll just give you a little example. Uh, I was a Superior Court judge, and uh, in Superior Court in North Carolina, uh, the major uh, felonies uh, come before the judge for a plea. Uh, this uh, person, who's a young boy, was charged with a, a very serious felony. It was uh, breaking and entering to uh, machines and taking money on numerous places. And what happened was some other adult males had picked him up 
taking them with them to break into some machines and into some buildings. And when law enforcement came, they ran and left him at the scene. So his attorney did not uh, do what he should have done, had him evaluate, determine what sort of uh, issues he might have, and was pleading him into some felonies. I started going over the transcript of plea with that uh, defendant and realized that he was stemming and wasn't making eye contact and didn't really appear to understand what he was pleading to. So I did not accept the plea and sent him back to be evaluated. But if I had not known as a judge about autism and to identify um, that young defendant, he would have had a felony conviction and no services and could have potentially been in prison. Uh, so we, we have to do a better job of educating people uh, before they get into the higher courts uh, about how to divert and uh, what uh, is really going on. And that's uh, probably more an issue of education, communication, and awareness. And I hope I, I probably got way off track with my answer to that question, but that's one of the biggest things that, that I want to focus on. Well, and that, that actually ties into a couple of the other questions I've gotten. Some of the parents have had experiences, uh, it looks like particularly with sort of, sort of kids who are, they're not really kids, with adults who are higher functioning, who don't come across great in court, and they feel like now the court system is somewhat prejudiced against them. So in one case, the parent says that they feel like the dis district attorney is sort of harsh toward their their son now that he's had a, a rough time in court. So I'm wondering if you can think of ways you might reshape that or if there are education programs that might specifically address those sorts of situations. Well, I think that that, again, district attorneys are attorneys and they're usually swamped with tons and tons of cases on their caseload. And what you have to do is get an attorney uh, who represents you and that person on the spectrum who's familiar with autism and who can get somebody uh, to, to come in and evaluate the, the person, whether it be a witness or a defendant, and say, this is why they're acting this way. Uh, this is why they're not making eye contact, why they seem to be uh, antagonistic toward you and, and not answering your questions. It's not because uh, they're an evil or mean person. Uh, it's because of the way their mind works. Uh, most autistic people, uh, at least I hate to make a blanket statement, but I say it, they, they don't really lie. Uh, they see things in terms of, uh, from my experience at least, in terms of it's black or white, and they don't see the shades of gray. Um, and uh, we have to educate the judge and the district attorney about that, and um, it, it's very hard to do that. I realize that because they're sometimes not open minds, and you have to get an attorney who is able and willing to really pursue. Uh, the rights of, of the person uh, that's going into court. And there are a lot of constitutional rights that you can exercise to make sure that uh, you receive a fair trial uh, and that someone is not wrongfully convicted, wrongfully sentenced, uh, not treated fairly in our court system. And it's uh, sometimes an uphill climb, but you cannot uh, just be run over uh, by prosecutors or judges or, or people that are willing uh, to do that simply because it's, it's quicker to dispose of a case that way. You have to make them slow down and take their time. Okay. Uh, this is a question about elopement issues and the, sort of the legal piece of that. So this family has a loved one who likes to elope from school <laughs> and they're wondering They've asked the school about invoking law, law enforcement in that situation, and it says here that the school um, replied that they hesitate to do that without knowing what they might get into. So the parents asking about, you know, sort of what advice would, might they have for the school or for the parent in terms of should law enforcement be called immediately, automatically, or, or do they, is the school right that they should delay? Well, there, there are several questions I have there because if the the child is eloping and uh, it presents a danger to the child, then of course 
you want to take whatever measures you, you can take to make sure that there's no injury uh, to the child. That has to be your first priority. Uh, and if the school's not able to prevent the child from leaving the school, then the school is going to have to be responsible enough to make sure uh, that the child is, is protected and that somebody's there to, to, to bring him back. Uh, the other thing is that there, need to be, there needs to be some sort of tracking device on that child, and we are pushing that. Uh, there are all kinds of various uh, devices now that uh, people can wear, and of course we use them for people with Alzheimer's who wander. Uh, so I would certainly, if I were that parent, look into getting a, some sort of a, a G GPS device. Uh, Project Lifesaver is one of the, the devices so that if he does run or, or leave the school grounds, he's easily lo located. Uh, even having, uh, now you can, of course, find my iPhone or whatever other uh, app application there is available. But if law enforcement gets involved, yes, there can be complications because law enforcement, if, if uneducated, uh, can start uh, bringing up things that you don't really want to get into in the court system. But if that's the only measure that you can take to make sure your child is safe, then I think it's a really close call. But I think that you should make sure that the child is safe, and that should be your first priority. Uh, you don't want them to get into a pond or a water source and, and something happen, and you sit there and say, why, why wasn't somebody called? Right. Okay, this is a question about awareness. This person saying, my grandson is diagnosed with autism. His mother's working with our local police department to implement a program in our community that will help them and other first responders identify citizens with PTSD, Alzheimer's, dementia, and autism. We were unable to find a national organization working to raise awareness regarding this issue. Did we just miss it? Are you aware of one? Well, I can say that, I, I hope that I can say correctly, the Autism Research Institute would be, uh, is raising awareness. Um, Autism Society of America um, has been working on that issue. Um, I know that we have chapters, and I don't, again, I don't know where the parent is located, but uh, we've certainly been trying to do that also through uh, autism uh, risk management, and, and it's hard to do it nationally. Uh, I, I hope and, and think that Autism Speaks has done that as well. So the, the parent, I wouldn't say they've missed it, but there are so many organizations out there doing different things that it's easy to say um, who's doing it and is there one organization doing that one thing. And I don't know of one organization that's doing it, uh, but I know that there are many that see it as a, a real issue. Yes, definitely. I think a lot of organizations are working on that initiative, um, but it's difficult because state by state, things really vary in terms of how the law works and, and also just in terms of the resources that are available. But congratulations to your daughter for taking that on. I think that's great. Um, this yeah, that's, that's the kind of thing we need in every state, really. Right, right. The next question is, uh, this is this is a question that's interesting about... Um, how assessment is done. So they're asking, well, this may be a state-specific question. In our state, the ombudsman has mentioned a statute in which if it is not possible to determine competency, the individual will be automatically sent to a state-run facility. Do you have any advice of, on navigating a situation like that? Well, I've really never heard of such a thing. Um, competency doesn't would not determine that someone would go to a state-run facility in any state that I'm aware of. Um, of course, I'm only really aware of what happens in North Carolina. Uh, competency has several different definitions. Competent to stand trial, competent to manage their estate, uh, competent to care for themselves. I, you know, I don't really know what definition there is, but we uh, have different services available to people in different areas of the country. Uh, sadly to say, there are different places that you can go and get uh, great services and other places where you have nothing. So it may be that in this part of the, the country where this person is, uh, there isn't anything else uh, other than some uh, state-run uh, 
inpatient facility. Of course, other places there are uh, places that the, the person can have a home and, and live in a home with other people and not be in some some large facility. Uh, but I don't. I'm not aware of anything that says an incompetent person goes into a, a state-run facility. Yeah, she's saying she's in Indiana. So I don't know if that helps at all. <laughs> it doesn't sound like it, but uh, yeah, it probably. Well, I know people in Indiana, and uh, some really good folks in Indiana might be able to help her. Okay, great. Maybe she can email offline, and we could yeah. help her out a little bit, connecting with yeah. other people. Okay. Um, one person's asking. Did you, it sounds like you mentioned a contact name in Florida. Could you repeat that information? It's uh, Jimmy Donahoe. And they can and probably was really with the Pensacola Police Department. Okay. Okay. You can and they can probably Google that person. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. So the next question. Um, so, in the heat of the moment, when you're dealing with a law enforcement officer as a parent, we asked this question sort of earlier about what is the first thing to say. But this person's asking, how can I stay calm? What are some strategies that you've heard taught to parents to keep the situation optimal with their loved one? What are things they can do to help calm the their the person they're caring for in that situation? So have you seen any strategies that people have discussed that have been effective in that way? Well, I'll just give you a specific example of something that happened with my son. Uh, he's been doing really, really well. He he's um, was shut up in the house for seven years. He just would not go out of the house. For about three years, he wouldn't wear anything except to pull up. And we don't know why he got that way. He Something happened out in, at, at school, maybe, or something that scared him. Uh, and then in the last, uh, I guess since maybe uh, March, he's suddenly willing to go out in a car. And this is really within the last three months and Denise, you know this. Um, he's going to, in a car. He's going into restaurants. He's putting on clothes, and uh, we don't know why he started back being willing to go out. But recently, uh, we took him out, and he's saying that he wanted to go to the dollar store. We didn't know which dollar store it was, so we took him to a dollar store, and apparently, it wasn't the right dollar store, and he got really upset. And then uh, someone that we know came up, saw him out in the parking lot, and tried to come up and talk to him during this time when he was really upset about not being in the right dollar store, and he started hitting uh, there in, in the public area. So what well, we were we were just terrified that somebody was going to see him hitting out at you know females, a uh, big adult male, and call law enforcement. So what we had to do is just say. You know, it's fine, everything's fine, just leave, step away, step away. It's hard to do that when somebody's hitting you or hitting out at you. Uh, and But we couldn't just leave him uh, uh, and step away from him. So we had to just be calm ourselves and let Jarrett know that we were there for him and get him back into a safe area. And with my son, uh, our strategies are different probably than they would be with someone else. Uh, with another person on the spectrum, but mainly it's a matter of just getting them into a, a safe area, a safe space, so that they have an opportunity to calm down and get themselves back under control, uh, and just having other people, you know, just a, a place, a space that so they stay away from and get, not get in the space. Uh, for example, and I'll give you another example, is uh, when we had to take my son to the emergency room, uh, he got he hurt his head and fell and hurt his head, and the nurses hadn't really been taught, uh, and partly our fault I guess, to not get in his face to check things like blood pressure and things of that nature, and of course they got kicked and hit and bitten, and it was really hard because they got upset and mad, and uh, we had to explain look he he's going to do this and you just need to leave him alone until he calms down. Uh, so, I don't have a magical answer other than you know your child or the person you're caring for, to you know what uh, helps them, and mainly it's a matter of you helping them and trying to focus on, on that rather than 
uh, how upset you are. Because if you're upset and law enforcement comes to the scene, you could end up in custody, which is not going to help you and it's certainly not going to help your child. Okay, this next person has a great question. I think it's a, one that would benefit a lot of us to get your tips on this. And because you have a foot on both sides, both in the legal environment, but also as a parent, I think you can probably help her shape what she needs to do. She says she's giving a presentation to law enforcement tomorrow on the parent's perspective. She'll have 10 minutes. So if you had to talk about the most important things for them to know in 10 minutes or less, what four or five topics would you want to make sure that you uh, captured? Ten minutes is probably about enough time to say this is what autism is and if you hear that word this is what you should expect or, or what the possibilities are. I would have really I would have a really good uh, some really good pictures uh, and maybe some really good slides uh, just and go through them really quickly. Uh, you're not going to have enough time to to give them scenarios or show any videos or video clips. So uh, I would give them, and I would give them handouts and, and resources they can go to if they're interested in learning more, uh, and tell them that you know who to contact uh, if they want to learn about uh, you know people on the spectrum and, and things that can happen. And I would probably emphasize how important it is that they do learn and how many people there are in this country uh, that uh, are being diagnosed uh, with autism and that they can run into people on the spectrum uh, all the time, anytime. Yeah, what we do, uh, what I would probably start out with is just having people raise their hands uh, if they know someone on the spectrum. You'll be, maybe you won't be, but you could be amazed about how many people are out there who have a son, grandson, and, or you know, so a niece or nephew that uh, is on the spectrum, and that helps a lot. Uh, but that's not very much time to tell them a, a lot, other than give them handouts and, and give them references. All right, this person is asking about nonverbal individuals. How, what you would advise law enforcement officials when they engage with somebody who's nonverbal? and how that differs from what they might do with somebody who's got higher functioning language. Well, my son's nonverbal for the most part, so if somebody, law enforcement came to him to try to get him to say what happened, are you hurt, uh, how do you feel, he would be completely unable to answer those questions. Uh, I could probably get him to point to something, but if his, he would always have a caregiver with him. Uh, he's usually, he's never alone. Uh, unless we had a bad wreck and everyone else was unable to speak, which, you know, that, that could be a possibility. Uh, so what we would try to do is have in the car or somewhere easily visible information about him uh, so that if, say, that he were, we were in a wreck or something happened, I would have in my glove compartment uh, a list or some, some really important points about my son. Uh, so that it would be available to law enforcement and uh, somewhere. My son doesn't like to wear jewelry, so that's, you know, I understand why that's a problem. Uh, as say, he just started wearing clothes. So, But on his body somewhere, it'd be nice to have information, uh, maybe in a pocket or sewn on to some, somewhere in his clothing. Uh, if you come on a scene and there's somebody uh, present alone who's nonverbal, uh, you're going to have to, the law enforcement officer is going to have to look for identification and address contact person, uh, whether it be in the form of uh, a card or jewelry or something of that nature. You touched a little bit on first responders. So we talked a little bit about your experience at the hospital. So when, when uh, parents or anybody's individuals are dealing with first responders, in the moment, on the scene, when there's a medical need. Do you have any tips about strategies that can be used? Obviously, you're not going to have visual supports and that sort of thing. So what are some things that they recommend parents or caregivers do with first responders on the scene? I would, uh, and there's actually a video that we developed in San Diego for, for that issue, but um, when it's a real emergency, um, 
Bill Canada and uh, we have a, a fellow named Ralph Carasquillo in California who've been to fire and emergency scenes and what they've had to do in the past if it's if it's serious enough you've got to restrain the person by they'll, they'll even wrap them in a blanket or something so that they can uh, work on them and save their life uh, of course that's a last resort but if it has to happen they're in a fire or something they have to be taken out of scene uh, there's uh, if if there's they're in an accident of course as I said you want you would want to have uh, identification uh, means of identification present uh, as far as dealing with first responders whoever the caregiver is needs to tell them uh, look my my child is going to be really upset if they see a needle uh, we're going to have to distract them in some way and and just if the, if they're able to hear you talk to them hold their hand you know things of that nature but First responders, you know, they're trained to get up in that person's face and start doing their various tests, and, and that maybe they have to do them. And with my son, he would probably be trying to hit him, or you know, if he's upset and hurt, uh, so they're going to have to restrain him. And you're going to have to let the first responders know this is the reaction they might get, and you're going to have to communicate. 